we are starting a series this morning. Um, I don't have a fancy graphic for you. I'll put that together and bring it next week, okay? Um, but, uh, but this series for the next two weeks is called Play It Again. Someone say, Play It Again. Play it again. So uh, we're, we're going to study the Great Commission, and uh, I, I want to start the message this morning with a quote. Um, and uh, it's actually about a really good friend of mine, um, great mentor and spiritual leader in my life. Dave um, serves um, the Northwest Ministry Network of the Assemblies of God up in um, the state of Washington. And uh, he wrote a book called Refocus. And um, in his book, he says this. He says, the term Missio Dei, someone say Missio Dei. And uh, I don't know if I have a slides person or not. Hopefully we do, because there's slides there. I think Grady was my slides person. There we are. Okay. The term Missio Dei. Say Missio Dei. Says, I know, it's another language, okay? Uh, so I put the translation in parentheses for you. Mission of God. The mission of God begins with loving God with all of one's heart, soul, mind, and strength. The greatest commandment, which is to love the one true God exclusively from all other so-called gods and to love one neighbor, one's neighbor as thyself. We must examine these commands to see the bigger plan of this missionary God. For the entire word of God and the mission or God's mission for humankind rests on these two commandments. So we're going to do a series for the next two weeks called Play It Again. If you've been around for a little while, um, it was two years ago when I was thinking about that. I was like, man, that was a long, like, I, it's crazy how quick time has gone. Two years ago when we, um, in our small groups, did a deep dive eight-week study on the Shema. And uh, the Shema is this word that means to hear or to do. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 9 is, is where we read the words of the Shema. The very first word um, is this word here. Someone say here. And if we go to the next slide there, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Um, this is the what Jesus says is the greatest commandment in all of scripture. Um, maybe. Are you guys up there? Okay, cool. Uh, so Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Uh, it says here. Here um, translated from Hebrew, the, the first word in this commandment is the word Shema. Shema is a word that means to hear and to do. And, and I'll, I'll read this passage in just a few moments, but we'll leave it up on the screen. Um, we, we did an eight-week study on the Shema, and then last week, if you guys remember, uh, or last year, it feels like it was last week, last year in the fall, we did a, a deep dive study into loving our neighbor. Um, we, we had a series called Like a Good Neighbor, and uh, did just uh, an intensive study of, um, of the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You guys know these aren't new commandments. This isn't new information. The problem that most of us have is, is actually doing the things that we know, um, putting them into practice. And um, before we can study or look at or explore the Great Commission, God's mission, the Missio Dei, we first have to be hearers and doers of the first and second greatest commandment, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all our soul, and all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And so, um, amen, come on. And, um, and so, let me go on a couple tangents, and then I'll get to my notes. Um, so, when we did this series on the Shema, we, we called the series Press Repeat. And, and the reason is, you'll see in the notes today as we walk through it again, um, is that we need to be reminded of the greatest commandment often. We need to be reminded often. And, um, and so we, we need to repeat it again and again. And it goes as well for the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself, to repeat this, to play it again. And so uh, I'm naming this two-week mini-series. It's basically a prequel to the next eight weeks of small groups is play it again. Uh, we're going to play it again. And some of you guys are already like, ugh, we already did eight weeks of this two years ago. Um, to be honest, you guys forgot everything I said two years ago. And you you need it to be taught again, but um, but uh, but we need to repeat. And and here's the deal: um, if if you're looking for a a like an enlightening spiritual experience to learn more, something that that you haven't, the, the gospel is not about secret knowledge. The gospel of Jesus Christ is is exposed. It's all hung out there, um, and it's deep as it is wide. And um, and 
if you want to experience this reality in your life, if we want to take the words of Jesus seriously, um, then it's not about learning new things. It's about practicing and applying and putting to work the things that we already know. It's about hearing and doing. And if we would be a people that would hear and would do, you would be amazed at the realities that life would open up for you. And here's the reality. As we, we talk about, Grady was talking about making disciples because some of you uh, are familiar with the Great Commission. You already know what we're talking about when, when we talk about that. Um, but in Matthew 28 is the Great Commission, and it's where Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every nation, um, to baptize them, to teach them all of his commandments. And Jesus says, surely I will be with you to the end of the age. Um, some of you guys are familiar with those words. If you're not, it's okay. We're going to study them for eight weeks, so you'll be very familiar very soon. Um, but this is, is where we get this commandment. And, um, and, and sometimes there's like things where it's like, oh, I already know that. Like I, I already, like we've read this before, we've talked about it before. But here's the reality. The reason any of you are in this room this morning is because someone in your life took the words of Jesus seriously, took the mission of Jesus seriously to make disciples of all nations. If it hadn't be so, you and I wouldn't be here today. And uh, Grady did a great job in, in just closing out worship there. He was talking about generations. Uh, that really is the heart of the mission, is that in every generation, the light of the gospel would shine brighter and brighter, that people would come to know and come to faith in Jesus Christ through his ambassadors, through his church. You and I are the church. We are his disciples, and he's commissioned us with this mission. And so, um, one, we should be excited about it because Jesus told us about it, because it's his mission that he's invited us to partner with him in. Um, but second, you should be excited about this because you, by definition, are the recipient of this. And, and if that doesn't get you excited, like, you should just stop church altogether, Okay, like it's no good. It's wasted on you if if what you've received isn't doing anything for you. Um, I, I was thinking this was the word picture. I told you guys I'm on a rabbit trail here intentionally, and then I'll get to the notes. Um, Lindsay and I were, were driving around. We have um, Lindsay's cousin in town and a, a friend with her this weekend. We've been driving around town, and they're talking about like how like pretty the area of the Rogue Valley is. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. We live in like some of you guys haven't lived in other parts of the country. This is pretty great down here. Um, problem is, when Lindsay and I moved here three years ago, um, it was all fog. We, like, accepted this position, decided we were going to move here, and literally for the first month of living here, um, it, was, it was, like, November, December, and, like, even the hills in the distance, we couldn't see them. Table Rock, I didn't know what that was. Uh, like, it was just pure fog, and... Um, and I told Lindsay, we were driving around, and, and I said, man, I'm just so grateful, like, we live here. Like, I, I wake up, I look, like, every time I drive, I just get giddy and, like, happy. I'm like, I live here. Like, this is, this is my home, you know? And, um, and I said, I'm so happy, because, like, if that wasn't the case, I think I'd be bored with it already, you know? I'd be like, I don't know, like, maybe let's get some scenery going. But the fog cleared away, and it's like, every day I drive through this wonderland, I'm like, I get to live here. This is so great, like, and that should be like our experience every day in, in the good news in the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? It's not like, oh, like I didn't know that before. It's like, no, just a refreshed reality of like, this is mine. This, I get to have this and call it my own. And, and not only that, but I, I get to share it with other people. And, um, and so I, I don't know if that motivates you in any way. I'm not trying to persuade you. Uh, I'm just trying to share, like, this is the experience I have with Jesus, and, and I think it should be all of our experiences with Jesus. And, um, and so I, I hope that when we talk about the Great Commission, it's not something you're like, oh, this is like another lecture for eight weeks. I, I hope it gets you, like, excited about, like, man, I want to be a person who hears and does the will of the Lord. Because I, I love the Lord, my God, with all of my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. And so that's why we're going to play it again. Because we can't get to the mission of Jesus without first coming to the first and the greatest commandment, which is this. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 9, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. 
Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Um, now, most of us, we, we tend to memorize just like the first part of that passage, and then we, we miss the instruction in the second part of that passage. Uh, the second part's the, the vea hafta, and um, um, it's this, this repeat reminder how often we are to be reminded to come back to these words, to come back to these commandments. And um, I, I don't have time to re-preach the whole eight-week series, but as we learned, um, heart, soul, and strength. Uh, these can more accurately be translated as mind, being, and existence. To love the Lord your God with all of your mind, with your, your thoughts. Um, this is why the instruction is to place this as a reminder on your forehead, because it's, it's your thoughts. It's our, our every action before it becomes an action starts as a thought. And, and so we're commanded to love the Lord our God with all of our, our mind, and then um, we get to our soul, which is kind of like there's a lot of weird history of Gnosticism and things that give weird pictures of the soul. But in Hebrew, it was a word nefesh, which was their word for body, their word for like the entire existence of, of a life. And so to love the Lord your God with, with your hands, with your feet, with your mouth, every bodily function that you have, your entire existence, to love the Lord your God with all of your being. And then there's this word strength, which is a Hebrew word, miod, um, and it essentially just means this, with, with all else. W whatever, like we're always as humans looking for the loophole, we're always looking for the thing that's not listed, like how much freedom do we have over here? And, and what God is saying is like, love me with all of your mind, with all of your existence, and if I hadn't listed everything already, anything else you can think of, love me with that. Love me with, with all else. There is an infinite number of ways to love the Lord your God. And he asks for all of it, complete unhinged devotion to him. And, um, and so you heard me preach this through the series, and I'll share it with you again today. Um, until we have mastered the practice of obedience, we will have mastered, when we have practiced the, ma the sorry, I need to read this really clearly because you guys don't have this one on the screen. When we have mastered the practice of obedience, we will have mastered the practice of listening. But until then, you and I must continue to listen. Because Shema is a, a word, it means to hear and to do, to listen and to obey. It's not good enough for us just to hear the words of Jesus or to memorize like cute phrases of scripture and hang them on walls with decorations we bought from Hobby Lobby. That's not what it means to follow Jesus. To love the Lord your God with all your heart is, is not only to hear, but it is in action and in deed to do. And so I don't think, well, I'll just give you the, the harsh reality. None of you guys are perfect at obeying this morning. Now, none of us take instruction and then follow it perfectly. Um, we all have work to do when it comes to putting into practice the words of Jesus and the commandments of the Lord. And until we've mastered that, until we've brought ourselves to perfection, which again, just harsh reality, uh, you can't, you won't uh, be brought to perfection this side of heaven. Um, we are working towards it, and, and I'll preach this so it'll make more sense, but we're, we're in progression. We're working towards this goal. It's our aim, but none of us have made it yet. None of us have received it yet. And so until then, you and I need to return back to these words. And we need to continue to listen. And the question is this, well, how often do I really need to do this? Well, pretty often. It says, the commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit down. How many of you guys are sitting right now? When you sit at home, when you walk along the road, I translate to like when I drive, I'm reminded often as I drive, I'm like, oh, the Shema, here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. I do it every day. I'm like out on my little drive from Shady Cove, and, and it brings a reminder to me. When you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, so when you go to bed tonight, when you wake up in the morning, tie them as a symbol on your head and, and write them, bind them as a sign on your forehead and write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. It's a lot of reminders. And really, it's just a short list because it could probably be more extensive than that. Because the reality is none of us are very good at remembering. 
How many guys just suck at remembering things? It's like, it's not, not my gig. Um, so I, I have a, a book in process. Um, we preached eight weeks of this series, and I was like, I really want to like write those thoughts down intentionally and, and script it into a book. And I, I've been in process of that. Um, I'm a little bit of a procrastinator when it comes to my book. Um, so it's been three years now. I've written two chapters. It's whatever. Um, but... Um, but from the, this is from the first chapter, and I just thought I wrote it better than I could make it up on the fly. And so uh, we'll give you guys a little bit more of an organized thought this morning. And so I'll walk through the progression of the scriptures, and uh, I get to Exodus chapter 19. And so I just want to read you guys like a snippet of this this morning. In Exodus chapter 19, 5 through 8, the Lord instructs to Moses, he says, Now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all peoples of the earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message that you must give to the people of Israel. So Moses returned down from the mountain, and he called together the elders and the people, and he told them everything that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. So that was a scripture. This is my little take on it. So Moses goes back up the mountain to tell the Lord the response of the people. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. Good response, poor follow through. Maybe a more truthful answer and one easier to live up to would have been, we'll do some of what the Lord has commanded us to do. Great story. However, the story hasn't ended. You and I are still living it today. God is still God, and fortunately and unfortunately, we are still human. What was true of Israel is also true of you and me, that we are better at forgetting than we are at remembering. We think that we're really good at remembering, but if you were to observe your life over the last 24 hours, and then you were to stack it up with this verse, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, how would you measure up? Until you and I have, have come to a place of, of perfect obedience, where we can live these things out without fault, then we can maybe retire from, from this reminder. But until then, we need to constantly be reminded over and over and over again to play it again, to press repeat. And that's why my, my main application point this morning, if you forget anything else, is this, is that there is no retirement from righteous living. There's no retirement, sorry to tell you. Some of you guys thought you were retired, but you're not. Um, actually, most of you who would be truthfully honest with me tell me retirement's a lot more work than, than not retirement. So I'm just taking that as gospel. That's what you guys have told me. Um, but there is no retirement from, from righteously. Our entire society is built on this idea of retirement. Um, it's built, I talk to young people all the time that are like, I'm going to work this hard. My goal is to have this much money in the bank by this age, and I'm going to retire early so I can go off and do things. Like, we hear that all of the time, all of the time. Our, our like, aim in life is to, like, get past this, like, thing holding us back called work uh, so that we can be free to do what we want. And, and we kind of act this way with faith. It's like we want to master the things of God so that we can like get away from like the work of the commandments of God so that we can be free to do what we want. <laughs> but there's, there's like this thing called sin that gets in the way that, that um, keeps us from the life that we actually want. The reality is there, there is like a, a hope of glory that exists that we will see that we, we actually have access to in the, the perfection of the person of Jesus Christ. Um, but you and I have not yet been resurrected yet. Uh, we have not yet fully entered into Christ's glory. Um, we still live in, in like a broken reality. And so you and I have to continue to put these words into practice that we would love. And, and should I say, too, this shouldn't be like, again, it shouldn't be like, ugh, got to wake up today, have to love the Lord today with all my heart, 
about my soul. I, I mean, like, it should just be this, like, man, I get to, like, this is where I live. You know what I'm talking about? Like, this, I get to love the Lord my God because he has perfectly loved me. And the only appropriate response is to love him in return. Like, I, I want to do this. Um, now, it's interesting how often this is repeated throughout Scripture. Um, Deuteronomy, so if you, you read your Bible, you guys just open it up for the first time. You've never looked at it before. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, so this is the Torah. It's the first five books of the Old Testament. Moses gives this commandment to Israel in Exodus. They're really quick, like most of us are, to say, oh, we're going to do everything you command. And then, like, two minutes later, they're already, like, on to, like, doing their own thing again. And, um, and so this instruction is repeated again and again and again. And it's almost like God knew they were going to forget because he tells them how many reminders they should have. Every time you walk through the door, every time you lie down, every time you wake up, um, you're going to need to bring this back to your attention. Um, the forehead, it's, it's an image of the mind and the hand is, is this picture of like our actions and our deeds. It's what we do. Um, and so in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses comes back to these words, and this is, this is Moses' final address to the people before he dies. Um, he's come to the end of his life. He's actually not going to enter the promised land. I don't have time to go into that story, but um, it's his, his very last instruction to the people, and this is what he chooses to say. He says, today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. So now I call on heaven and earth to witness to the choice that you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. And he says this is the key to your life, that if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land that he swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we move on from the book of Deuteronomy to the book of Joshua. And Joshua, it's, it's new leadership, but it's the same command. And what you'll find all throughout Scripture, if you study this, and, and maybe you guys have noticed this after we, we did our deep study in it, that as you read Scripture, you're like, huh, those words sound familiar. Huh, like maybe that wasn't a new idea that just came on this page, but maybe it's a thread. Maybe it's a theme. In the book of Joshua, Joshua is the new leader of Israel, and he says this. He says, be strong, be very courageous, be careful. Why do we have to be careful? Because we're quick to forget. Be careful to obey all the instructions that Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning to either the right or the left. For then you will be successful in everything that you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. For only then you will prosper and succeed in everything you do. Transformation. Um, unfortunately, is a, a process and not an occurrence. We live in a transactional society. Um, we pay money for things and hope to get something in return. Um, some of you guys try to do that with tithing. You, like, tithe things and then try to get things in return. You're like, Pastor, if I give enough money, will you cut your hair? No. Um, <laughs> transformation is a, a process. It's not an occurrence. Um, it, it's not this transactional thing where it's like we just, like, it's, it's all there. It's, it's a process in motion, and um, there's certain things, you guys know this, there are like revolving um, doors in our existence. There's things that in everyday life, in everyday practice, we just come back to, uh, like brushing your teeth, or showering, or putting clothes on, or paying your electric bill. Like there's, there's things that are just always going to come back around. They're on repeat. We do them again and again. Um, certain actions, you don't simply stop. There, there's like a particular repeated process that's involved um, daily. Um, there's the, these words that I hear in my house. Um, and uh, I have, I have a, a six-year-old and a four-year-old currently. Um, and we just added a new one into the mix. And he's eight months now. Um, and um, the, the ones that can talk and communicate... Um, sometimes I'll be sitting on the couch, I'm doing whatever I'm doing, hanging out, or I'm in the backyard, um, and I'll hear this shout, this scream from the other side of the house. It's usually muffled behind a door, um, and the words are this, Dad, I'm done. 
Bryce, can you help me out? Um, I, every day, for the last, let's see, I'm 29, at 23 is when I started this journey, have been wiping butts <laughs> that are not mine. And that's not the way I think life should be. Um, I had 23 years of great living. I, I never, never occurred to me. And lately, I don't go a day of my life without wiping someone's butt. Now, it's great. Sienna's old enough. She doesn't quite need help anymore. Occasionally, there's a struggle, but um, it's the four-year-old. Um, but now I've added an eight-month-old, and, and he's no good at all. Um, so I'm constantly coming back to this and, and cleaning someone's butt. Um, now, the goal, because you guys should know that, that everything in life, like, again, our focus is on retirement. It's like, when do I get to be done with this? So the goal is with proper instruction, with repeated practice, with maturity, um, hopefully there will come a day in my household where I don't have to wipe anyone's butt but my own, okay? <laughs> the day's in the future. Um, some of you have told me um, that it's important this instruction because there might come a day in my life when I'm old enough when you might need to call on those kids to help you. So, um, so I'm doing a really diligent job to teach them well right now. But I hear these words, Dad, I'm done. And, um, and lately it's, it's become, you don't need my help. You can do that on your own. You can, you know, do it, do the work. And, um, but sometimes there's just this protest, no, Dad, I need help, especially if it's number two, um, then they need extra help. And um, so, but sometimes, like, and it's, I mean, it's glorious when it happens. They'll come out, all their clothes are on, which is a miracle in itself. Um, and they're like, um, I went to the bathroom successfully, and how many of you guys know the question that gets asked, did you wipe? Did you wipe? You know how many times that blank face comes on, and so the instruction is go back to the bathroom and wipe. Like, I, I don't want to do it. You know how to do it, so go, go do it. Um, you know, there's, some of you guys are like, man, how does pastor do this? Like, he just <laughs> brings it. So, hero is the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, love the Lord your God, repeat these things to your children. When you're at home, when you're away, when you lie down, hopefully now when you're on the toilet, you'll remember this instruction. Oh, yeah, hero is the Lord is our God, because this is a daily occurrence. None of you are, are going to retire from this. Um, you, some of you guys have been to the bathroom more than three times already this morning, okay? Um, we need these reminders. Why? Because we can't stop. We have to do the work. We have to do it. It's not good enough to know how to wipe your butt. You need to actually wipe your butt. Otherwise, you'll run into complications. And it's not good enough to just know scripture and to know the things that the Lord wants you to do, to know like, oh, I went to church this Sunday. It's not enough if we don't put into practice. And there's a day for each of us coming when the Lord will look at you and me and he'll ask, did you do it? Did you do it? And until that day, you and I don't get to stop doing it. Because transformation is a process and not simply an occurrence. It reminded me of, um, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Bugs Life. Um, it's an animated film by Pixar. I grew up on it. Um, there's this really fat caterpillar in the movie. Um, his name's Heimlich. And he dreams one day of becoming a butterfly. Um, and many of you know that the process of becoming a butterfly is you got to, you know, get in the cocoon and they sit there for, I don't even remember how many days, but a long time. Um, and when the transformation is complete, right, they emerge from their cocoon completely different, completely transformed into a new being. I think there's a picture of this. Um, the end of the movie, this is Heimlich. Um, he emerged a little early from the cocoon. Some of you guys didn't laugh at that quite well enough. Um, this is like the concluding scene of the entire movie. 
And he goes, I'm finished. And he comes out, and uh, he's got these tiny little wings that can't support the, the weight of his body. And then there's these other insects that can fly, and they carry him and fly him off. And that's how the, the movie ends. I think there's too many of us that look like this, that live like this. And it's like, well, I've been following the Lord for 50 years. I got saved back in 19-whatever. Or that one summer at summer camp, or my parents taught me this, or, you know, I've done the work, I've taught my children that. And we want to retire from the process. We want to just say, okay, well, I've, I've done the work. But we haven't yet reached goal. We haven't yet reached completion. Uh, we can't stop the work of transformation early because it just doesn't function. It doesn't work. God is still at work in you and me. And, and what we should be able to testify is to the work that Jesus is doing. You and I should be able to look at ourselves and identify where God is at work, where life is at process, where he is sanctifying us and making us more and more like the person of Christ and forming us into his image to walk through this, this process of, of transformation. John Mark Comer says this, he says, but we all have a gap between who we are and who God is, between the way that we live and the way of Jesus. Following Jesus is about closing that gap one step at a time. For those of us who desire to follow Jesus, this is the reality we must face that if we are not intentionally being formed by Jesus himself, then it is highly likely that we are unintentionally being formed by someone or something else. We're all in process, and we should be able to identify that process. And don't take pressure from me. It's, it's not an occurrence. So no one is expecting you to be the person of Christ Jesus himself tomorrow. But the Bible teaches us that we have a sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in our life, and he is in process within our lives. And following Jesus is about continually inching that gap closer and closer to the person of Jesus. And you and I should be able to identify in our life where that process is at work. I know I can, and I know if you live with the spouse or someone that is very close to you, they could probably identify some of these things better than you can. It probably point out where the Lord might need to do a work on some of you. Some of you guys just like discipleship's all about accountability. It's why we believe in small groups because we don't want to leave any child behind, okay? Um, you got to look at people sometimes and just ask, are you doing the work? Did you wipe your butt today? Okay, did you do it? Because it doesn't seem like you did it. Doesn't seem like something's off. You know what I'm saying? That face someone has when they come out. And just like something's off today. Did you did you wash? Did you rinse? Did you repeat? Like it's great that you showered yesterday, but you gotta do it again. You gotta come back to the process of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the problem is that you and I are better at forgetting, if we're honest, than we are at remembering. We need to keep the message close at hand. We need it to be on our forehead. We need it to be on our hands. As often as we encounter these things, is as often as we should be reminded to love the Lord our God. So we're going to be jumping into a series in our small groups. It's called Upward or Onward, Upward, Outward. And um, it's going to be a study on the Great Commission. But before we can study the words of Jesus of the, the commandment to go into all of the world and to make disciples, we have to first ask the question, are we disciples ourselves? Are we following the basic instructions and the teachings of Jesus? And not only are we hearing it, but are we, are we doing it? James says this in James chapter 1, 22 through 25. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And I love in this translation where it says, deluding yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror, 
For once he looks at himself and then goes away, he immediately forgets what sort of person he was. But one who looks intently into the perfect Torah, the word of God, that gives freedom and continues in it. It's an important word, continues in it. Not becoming a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He shall be blessed in what he does. Too many of us, um, you guys remember those books, and I, I'm not saying they're bad books, but um, uh, my mom had a few of them growing up. Chicken Soup for the Soul. You guys remember those? They're cute. Um, too many of us treat the words of Jesus like chicken noodle soup for the soul and not essential instructions for daily living. Instructions that you and I cannot afford to forget because as Moses would say in Deuteronomy, this is the key to your life. This is the key to your life. Matthew 7, 21 issues a warning. Jesus says, look, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter there's a wise man, um, he said this, if you love me, obey my commandments. And um, I was going to put the scripture reference, but I quote books to you guys all the time, and I thought it'd be fun just to quote Jesus without a, a number reference. Jesus said these words, he said, if you love me, obey my commandments. How quick are we to say, I love you, Jesus. We will do everything you ask. And then like two minutes later, we're back to doing whatever the thing is we were doing because it's what we wanted. And we're not quick to be in step with the Spirit, to be careful to obey all the instructions of the Lord. And it's not that we don't screw up because every one of you in this room is a really good royal screw up, okay? That's why we're teaching this. It's, it's why we're coming back to it because we need it desperately. I need it desperately. And I know, um, I know it's a funny analogy, and some of you guys are like, Pastor, stop using that analogy. I just think it's a good in your face, like you're not going to forget it. Did you wipe your butt? You know, we need people in our lives to ask us that question. Because if there's no one looking out for us, we can get away with it for some time. We can walk around like everything's good, like there's nothing going on underneath the facade that we put up. But are you doing it? Did you do it? Have you done it again? Some of you guys are like, yeah, I did it 30 years ago. <laughs> cool. Um, you remember that picture of the fat caterpillar? It's good, good self-portrait, okay? If you did it 30 years ago and you haven't done it since, okay, we got to come back to it. We got to keep doing it. If you love me, you will obey my commandments bring you back to the quote I started with in the beginning that the, the mission of God, the term missio Dei, and, and if you didn't know, I mean, this is what scripture is all about. And we talk about Jesus being the pinnacle, and he, he absolutely is, but God is Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, eternally existing, and God has, has given everything he has to the sake and the cause of, of his mission. And it begins with loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That the greatest commandment is to love the one true God exclusively from all other so-called gods and to love one's neighbor as thyself. We must examine these commandments to see the bigger plan of this missionary God. The entire word of God and the mission of humankind, it rests on these two commandments. So the first is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. Jesus says, we're going to play it again next week. Um, that the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Some of you guys are like, well, I'm really good at the first part. That's great. But if you're not doing the second part, you're actually not doing the first part. If we don't love those who we can see, how can we love our Father in heaven whom we cannot see? The book of John would tell us. We have to examine ourselves. We have to press repeat. We have to come back to these words again. Here's the reality. Our world would be a, a much different place. We would be participating in a vastly different experiential reality if every one of us who claimed to follow Jesus actually did what he said. 
let that one sink in for a little bit. Especially in this country, it's not short of people who claim to follow Jesus. It's not short of people that attest to faith. Let's bring it home right here. It's not short of people who attend church every Sunday. But that doesn't mean that there's a work of transformation going on within you. Because it's a process that we subject ourselves to, that we have to participate in. And we like to complain about the world. We like to wish things were different than they are. Man, uh, I read a book recently. It said um, something about the percentage of people professing faith, Christianity, all that stuff. But then it defined the words of a disciple. And um, we'll talk about this in the, the series. A disciple is, is someone who hears and he does all that Jesus commands. A disciple is someone who, who loves and follows Jesus by hearing his teaching and doing all that he commands. And after defining discipleship, apprenticeship to Jesus, he said there's only about 4% of the American population that actually participates in that. Churches all over the country, people writing books, people with scriptures from Hobby Lobby all over their wall. I got a neighbor with a Christian flag, flies it high. I don't know. I don't know him personally enough to like make a judgment. That's not what this is about. But what I'm saying is we can put on the outward appearance of things. We can claim to things. We can say we believe things, but, but it's not enough just to hear. We actually have to do. And you and I both know that if everyone who claimed to believe these things, actually did these things. <laughs> Can you imagine how different our experience of this life would be? So what about you? What about me? Are you doing the work? Are you allowing Jesus to do the cleansing and the, the sanctifying work? And remember, I didn't put it in here, but James, he says it's not only a sin, he says it's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. Some of us are just like, well, I haven't looked at porn and I, I haven't been addicted to whatever that thing was that used to hold me and I haven't, um, you know, been, been unfaithful to my wife or fill in the gap. All these, I don't cuss. We're like, I, I don't do all the, the list of no's. Okay, but what about the list of do's? What about the list of like the great commission, like the last words Jesus gave to you, like the most important thing, everything culminated, and he's like, hey, I'm leaving, um, but now I'm giving you with all authority, go. How many of us are doing that? And that's not the, everything hinges on these two things, to love Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And with one, one quote this morning, and then um, I'll just invite some, some soul searching this morning. Um, Francis Chan, in his book, Multiply, he says this, so what comes to your mind when you think of Jesus' command to make disciples of all nations? It's the great commission in the church. Many read these words as if they were meant to inspire pastors or missionaries on their way out to the mission field. But have you ever considered that maybe Jesus' command is meant for you? Most Christians can give a number of reasons why they cannot or should not disciple other people. As convincing as these excuses may seem to us, Jesus' commands do not come with exception clauses. Jesus has commanded you to make disciples. Now, I'm going to do my work because the, the work of a pastor, as Paul instructs, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So I'm going to invite you to join me for eight weeks as we study this together. And there's a lot of conceptions, misconceptions. I'm not saying I have all the answers, but, but I think a lot of times pastors stop short at this spot right here. And they go, well, Jesus said to go, and so now you need to go, and when was the last time? And they don't define, and they don't teach, and they don't instruct, okay? So what I don't want you to feel from me um, over the next eight weeks is this pressure of like, oh, I'm not living up to something. 
But what I want to invite you to do is if you're someone that says, look, I, I desperately love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and strength, and, and I'm putting into practice loving my neighbor, and, and I want to do all the things that Jesus has instructed me. I just don't know where to start. I don't know how. What does it actually look like to make disciples? This is what the next eight weeks is all about. We're going to explore God's mission and his invitation for us to participate in it and how you don't need to have a seminary degree to do this. You don't have to have the right education because everything we need has been equipped in us through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And, and we're going to talk about it and we're going to work through it. And um, so I want to invite you, if this is something like, you know, I don't know if I'm doing this. Or maybe I am doing it, but I've, I don't know if I'm going about it the right way. I don't, you know, where you fall on that spectrum. This is what the next eight weeks is all about. Is you and I taking seriously the command of Jesus to make disciples. And the reality is that every single one of you in this room today is here because someone in your life, very personal, someone in your life took this command seriously. And it's the reason you and I have come to the experience of faith in Jesus Christ today. And Jesus, from all of eternity, has been asking you and I to participate in this with him, in the work of making disciples, in the work of his mission that he has been on from the beginning of time. And so I want to invite you to do that. And, and in part of that, step one is this process is, is to, to do the, the things that he's asked again and again and again. And next week, we'll play it again some more as we talk about loving our neighbor. But all across this place this morning, if you just take a moment of reflection, I want to invite you to close your eyes. Um, I don't always tell you to close your eyes. Um, and it's nothing spiritual. It's just a, a practice of removing some of the distractions that you might have right now to just really lean in and just to be still before the Lord as we talked about a couple weeks ago. Just ask the Lord to, to search. God, am I truly loving you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my strength? And God, the reality is I know that I'm not. I know there's a piece of my life. There's something held back. There's something that you're, you're reaching for and asking for this morning. And so whatever that is, just ask the Holy Spirit, God, what do you see in me this morning? Where are you wanting to be at work, employed in my life, transforming me? into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Just sit with that for a few moments this morning. Jesus, you instructed your disciples that um, as you left this earth, you said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but I'm sending you an advocate. He is the Holy Spirit who will reveal all truth, and all that he says to you is, is from me. Where we just invite the work and the person of the Holy Spirit into this moment this morning, Lord, recognizing that all that, that comes from him comes from you. And Lord, you, you're working on us, transforming us. And God, it's a joy. More than any teaching on the Holy Spirit, as we read the Gospels, we read about your promise of the Holy Spirit is connected to the joy of the fellowship that you experience, have experienced for all of eternity. And you prayed that the Spirit would be within us so that our joy would be your joy. Lord, would you give us just a desire, an excitement, just an overwhelming pleasure within your spirit to become more like the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, I don't know why you're speaking across this room this morning, but I, I pray that it would be felt, that it would be experienced, and that, Lord, we would just take seriously the commands of following you, of loving you, the joy and the pleasure of loving you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. God, it's not empty in return because you have forever unconditionally loved each and every one of us. So God, do your work within us this morning. Cleanse us, sanctify us. Lord, bring us back to this reminder 
even as we get up and we leave through the door this morning, we'll be, be reminded again because we're quick to forget, Lord, the desire that you have for us to, to be close to you, to experience you, and to be conformed into your own image, your likeness. God, the, the perfection of this life, life to the full and satisfaction in you. So Jesus, would we, we leave satisfied this morning, would leave just full of your joy, full of the personhood and the work of your spirit. And um, God, we just say, do it again. Do it again. And we wake up tomorrow to say those words over and over again until we reach the finish line, the perfection. God, we keep our eyes on Jesus, the champion, and the perfecter of our faith. And Lord, we just remain focused on that wholeheartedly today. As we leave this place, in your name we pray, amen.